Thank you. Thank you all for having me here. Um, this is my first trip to Macon. Um, it's much warmer than my, my last trip, which was to Pine Ridge, South Dakota, uh, where I arrived in time for a blizzard. Um, and uh, Georgia seems to be, and arguably, I suppose, much more friendly than my usual uh, time in Washington, DC. But I'd like to start out with something, um, by saying something uh, about this, about our time together here. Uh, some of us may look at this as a cybersecurity conference, or uh, also you may be looking at it as a class assignment where you have to listen to a bunch of speakers. But really, it's time out of your day, time out of your week, and time out of your life. Um, so uh, I'd like you to make this something meaningful where you learn, teach, share, listen, and connect. Um, and when you leave, uh, apply what you gain from your time here. The value of this time together is measured by the value of what you, what you do with what you gained here. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about how I serve uh, our country in the United States Public Health Service uh, as an officer, also as in my role as a chief uh, information officer for, the federal, for a federal health care agency, and give you some general thoughts and, ch and challenges about health, health IT and cybersecurity. Uh, like uh, Guy Boyle earlier, um, I too gain a feeling of contribution to uh, the greater good through my IT skills as I apply them in my role. Um, so uh, I'll give you a little perspective about, about where I'm coming from and the frame of reference where I speak so you'll perhaps understand um, all, what I'm going to tell you later. Uh, as, I'm, as mentioned, I'm a captain in the United States Public Health Service. Um, I'm assigned to the Indian Health Service where I serve as the Chief Information Officer. Um, to give you a little more uh, detail about some of those points, first of all, what is the Public Health Service? The Public Health Service is a force of approximately 6,500 highly qualified public health professionals, and we're led by the United States Surgeon General. Uh, though we look like the Navy, and I can do a really, really good, I want the truth, um, we are, have similar origins and to our Naval uh, Service partners in both the Navy and uh, the Coast Guard. The PHS is one of seven uniformed services in the United States, uh, but most people know what I term the big five, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard, uh, but there's actually two more, and one of which is the Commission Corps of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Uh, they were founded in, in 1970 and as a successor to many Coast Guard functions. Um, and then there's also the United States Public Health Service, um, Ali, the United States Public Health Service serves as a, as a medical uh, augmentation to almost all of the other services. However, the PHS mission is different um, and it's, it's what, we, what makes us different from the others. As mentioned, the, public, uh, the, the mission of the United States Public Health Service is to pr protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of our nation. We're an all-officer corps and we have no enlisted or warrant ranks. Um, arguably, and this is what I believe, is the PHS is perhaps the most difficult service to get into, not because we have overly demanding physical skills, uh, skills requirements, but for our requirement in a qualifying degree for commissioning, which in many cases is a master's degree or higher. We fill essential public health leadership roles and clinical service roles within the nation's federal government agencies and in many professional capacities, such as physicians, nurses, dentists, dietitians, pharmacists, veterinarians, and health service officers, which encompasses health IT. PHS officers serve in a variety of positions throughout the federal government and agencies and programs in areas of disease control and prevention, biomedical research, uh, uh, food, drug, and medical device regulation, mental health services, drug abuse, and also direct patient care delivery. The public health, uh, the PHS Commission Corps, as I mentioned, as mentioned, has it had its beginnings in the creation of the Marine Hospital Service uh, in 1798 under President John Adams, which makes us the fifth oldest service. Our mission, the first mission came as the Marine Hospital Service. It was charged with the care and maintenance of merchant sailors and, and later uh, our, our, the full gamut of our nation's sailors. Uh, as, the, as the country grew, so did our ever-expanding mission. Um, it included roles such as health initiatives that protected commerce and the health of America. So we spent a lot of time actually boarding ships and doing quarantining uh, cargo and crew. Um, 
One such role, uh, which quarantine, was under the direction of the supervising surgeon, or later the Surgeon General. The first one, John, uh, Dr. John Maynard Woodworth, was appointed in 1871 as the supervising surgeon. He's credited with crediting. He's credited with creation of the Commission Corps, and he organized the Marine Hospital Service medical personnel along a military structure in 1889 to facilitate mobile health professionals which could be moved around the country in the, in, in the service of the country. We've had other notables in the PHS. Dr. Luther Terry in the 1960s did extensive work, groundbreaking work in, in tobacco, and Dr. C. Everett Koop, who is somewhat notable, uh, in the 1980s did uh, extensive work in AIDS, abortion, and also nicotine addiction. We, we've had our heroes too. Uh, we've had a couple of roles in movies. It, there was a movie released in 1950 called Panic in the Streets that won an Oscar, which starred Richard Widmark, who was big back then. I know none of you heard him, but uh, as a PHS officer fighting a plague in the streets of New Orleans. We've also had more modern movie pre presentation, representation rather. Uh, since then, Brian Cranston of Breaking Bad appears in the 2011 film Contagion as Rear Admiral Lyle Haggerty, um, and you see him in the scenes which are stationed at the CDC. Now, considering we've made it to the big screen in the, in the past, um, I think as a, nice, as a nice ending to The Walking Dead, there's a role for a PHS officer, and frankly, I offer my service to the country in that role. Uh, but the PHS uh, uh, allocates officers to, this, uh, to all seven uniform services, depending on the health or medical needs of the other uniform services. So it's equally likely you will find us alongside our Navy or Coast Guard uh, sailors, or in Afghanistan, or in, on Indian reservations, or guarding the nation's points of entry. Now, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm stationed at the Indian Health Service, and that's an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services that's responsible for providing health care services to American Indians and Alaska Natives. The provision of health services to members of federally recognized tribes grew out of a special government-to-government -government relationship um, between the federal government and Indian tribes. This, this relationship was established in 1787 and is based in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which is given form uh, by numerous treaties, laws, Supreme Court rulings, and executive orders. The IHS runs a, er, provides comp comprehensive health service delivery, uh, that's patient care, in hospitals, clinics, and health stations uh, for Na American Indians and Alaska Natives who are members of the 566 federally recognized tribes across the United States in 36 states, including Alaska. We have facilities that spread from the bottom, that span from the bottom of the, the Grand Canyon, that's the Havasupai, uh, to Maine, and from Alaska to Florida, where the Seminoles are. Um, and most of these locations are in rural America. The geographic dispersion of our communities and uh, the, our communities of patients makes the facilities uh, that provide health care. Um, on a network that I oversee, which, which actually makes it the largest rural healthcare IT network in the United States. And there are challenges associated with delivering, um, healthcare, delivering healthcare over a network of services that are more than just rural, but also remote. So as I serve in this capacity as a CIO, as the CIO for the agency, and so what is a CIO? And some of you may someday want to be a CIO. You may want to be one now, but you may want to be someday soon. Um, it's the chief information officer. And the chief information officer, as I see it and as I portray it, is more than just the chief computer nerd officer. Um, this, and this links back to something we heard from an earlier um, presentation on employable skills. But my boss calls me the chief interpreter officer because mostly I spend, my I spend most of my time interacting with senior executives in my organization as the person responsible for health technology and computer systems that support enterprise goals because I work to increase the connection and communication between what they want and what they need and how we can answer them. As a member of my, my organization's executive leadership uh, where I support the aspect of business, the business aspect that use technology. But CIOs are, are needed for management of IT resources as well as for the planning of technology including policy, and practice development, budgeting, resource, and training. 
In addition to this, CIOs are becoming increasingly important in calculating how to increase um, organizational effectiveness and or in, in other industries, organizational profits uh, via the use of technology frameworks. The calculations of the value of IT are not easy. And we could spend a lot of time discussing them, but they are an integral part of properly managing IT resources. In this way, CIOs are needed to decrease the gulf uh, between the roles that are carried out by IT professionals and non-IT professionals in the business, in order to, or in, the, in my case, the federal agency, in order to set up effective working relationships. The CIO must fulfill this role as a business leader and CIOs understand the business of the enterprise in order to help the organization succeed through the use of IT. In my case, that means understanding the clinical flow of the delivery of healthcare. And that's a stretch for me. I'm an IT person by training. Understanding what happens at each point of patient engagement and understanding the data needs that, are, that need to be available to understand the decisions that are, need to be made in the delivery care. As a CIO, I must also make executive decisions regarding things such as the purchase of IT equipment from suppliers or the creation of new IT systems. CIOs, therefore, are responsible to lead and direct the workforce of IT professionals for their specific organization. As a CIO, my my, often my recommendation for a solution is not technical. Not every problem, as I understand it and as I interpret it, can be solved by adding more technology. And sometimes a change in business process or a change in other resources, it's much more cost effective than new technology. What I like in particular about being a CIO in the healthcare industry is that technology in healthcare is at an immature point in the technology maturity cycle, meaning there is a lot of change and a lot of room for expansion and revolution. People often come to me uh, with, bright, with a bright, shiny technical solution and that is looking for a problem to fix. When many of which, when when really the dynamic needs to be much needs to be reversed, um, much of much of the healthcare industry is still adopting technology. I enjoy a, a quote I, I saw in the uh, journal of American Journal of Managed Care, and I think this actually uh, explains where the healthcare industry is in trying to adopt technology to, for, for some of its business processes. Technology is not simply, quote, electrifying the covered wagon. The goal is to apply new, new capabilities in new and exciting ways to patient care and organizational performance. Even though healthcare has made dramatic gains in IT over a short period, the healthcare system and health IT vendors are still playing catch up to an ever accelerating trends in technology and society. Health IT overall is in a period of transition and under broad, and the direction under the bro, of broader US health policy, which direction it will take is uncertain. However, health IT is effectively now a required business capacity and capability within the delivery of patient care. But what is it that makes health IT so difficult? Well, a book, a quote from a book that I recently read entitled The Digital Doctor by Dr. Robert Watcher uh, helps capture the, the essence of, of what's going on. The quote uh, goes, one of the greatest challenges in healthcare technology is that medicine is at once an enormous business and yet an exquisitely human endeavor. It requires the ruthless efficiency of a modern manufacturing plant, yet the, jail, the gentle hand-holding of, of a parish priest. It's about science, but it's also about art. It's eminently quantifiable, yet stubbornly not. That quote stands out to me because it encapsulates the environment that we try to further through the development and use of, of the health IT systems that I oversee, which serve my stakeholders. I find uh, the book, uh, The Digital Doctor, fascinating, and if you're considering a career in health IT, I suggest you have a look at it. The book details vivid stories and contains good analysis as the author exposes the good, the bad and the ugly of health uh, of electronic health records, uh, health system records, and also all things electronic in complex settings of hospitals, uh, physicians' offices, and pharmacies. I read the book and I found example the event 
I found the examples which are portrayed and many of the issues presented are the same that my staff and I deal with every day and are in many ways common across all health IT systems in use in hospitals and clinics today. In addition to help, helping educate me on a number of viewpoints, which I wouldn't have normally considered, surrounding electronic health record systems and health IT systems, when I read the book, I gained a camaraderie, a feeling of camaraderie from it. Um, it's not often that I get to read pages upon pages of user complaints about an electronic health record system that aren't mine to fix. <laughs> As the book describes, and as the U.S., as those of us in the United States have lived in the past few years, we've seen tremendous changes in health information technology, and that's an understatement and worthy of repetition. The past few years have seen tremendous change in health information technology. It's probably because it's easier to identify in a hospital and clinic what hasn't changed rather than what has. We've seen a change not only in the technology itself, but in the change in the communities of stakeholders uh, who surround health information technology. We've added communities of users and connected communities of users who continued, who have added to demands rather uh, for changes to our systems and reprioritized changes we were already planning to make. You know, in the early days of health IT systems, the community of stakeholders was fairly limited to those who were closest to the system, uh, those who put data into the system, and those who, meaning those who typed on the keyboard, and those who got information out of it, who went and ripped the the, uh, the report off the printer, um, initially for reports uh, which were used in the, to document patient care. Um, at first, stakeholders who made demands for our changes were much much closer than those we see in our for our health systems today. Sure, this, those stakeholders are still there, and they still, they still want to add requirements for changes, and they are nearby to our system, I mean, they're close to our system. Those are um, health programs and providers and users and technical staff. But now the stakeholder community has, ex has expanded, and their requirements for software updates and capabilities come in from much more distant relationships. We get, change, we get demands for changes to our system from things such as cybersecurity threats from across the other side of the world, from hardware vendors who we barely, who we have longstanding relationships or new relationships with, software vendors through licensing changes and capability changes, legislation, our health information exchange partners, and soon we, we will receive an increased number of demands for system changes from our patients. The patients my organization serves will ask for more access and more functionality than we've ever experienced before, and, and my organization has to be prepared to answer that. As a side note, this is already happening in other systems. Epic, the, one of the leading vendor in patient information healthcare portal in the world, claims it has more non-clinical users, that, that's, I mean, that's patients and families, than the clinicians themselves who put data in. More subtle than a help desk ticket, a, 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 uh, asking for a code change to our system, health IT professionals can expect to see more changes and emphasis and priorities for health information technology, specifically through a change in the use of the data, a change in the communities that use our data, and a change in the, in the requirement for reporting organizational performance and healthcare patient outcomes. That is what will continue to guide us. These changes that challenge us mean that more than ever, health IT professionals will need to focus on the ownership of outcomes that we derive from our systems to ensure that the use of our systems improve the delivery of patients and delivery of care. We have to make sure we get this right, and I believe that my health IT staff's focus uh, ch on changing the underlying health IT system, which supports the delivery of patient care, for American Indians and Alaska Natives, we have led the way for the change in the, for a rise in the quality of care over the past few years and will continue to do so. Or stated another way, health IT contributes to better health care outcomes. But ownership of outcomes. Now, outcomes is a word that healthcare professionals use as part of their vernacular when they seek to determine the success of what they are presently doing or what they should do to guide their next step. What is the outcome? And that's the question that follows every healthcare event or diagnosis. Outcomes is a concept that I argue that we as a community of, of IT professionals 
must adopt as part of our currency to gauge our success and to determine what our next step should be, whether it's in the healthcare setting or not. In the healthcare world, national initiatives such as the Medicare and CHIPS Reauthorization Act, or MACRA, and the Office of National Coordinators um, Health IT Initiative for Meaningful Use for Health IT, or sometimes shortened to Meaningful Use, is asking the question of meaning and the outcome of the nation's healthcare systems. And will con they continue to ask those questions for billing and for other for a payments, healthcare payments, going forward. No longer is there a payment for health professionals on the volume of patients served, but rather the raise in the care, rise in the care. In a healthcare organization, the language of out, uh, outcomes has never been the number of systems generated health insurance claims submitted or the number of medical referrals sent via electronic submission. Particularly in health IT, it's not the number of emails processed, it's not the number of Microsoft patches installed. Health outcomes is not uptime, disk speed, or bandwidth. Outcomes are the stories of how all those things make lives better, and which is something we work hard every day to prove and improve. What I tell my staff is gather the examples of how we have impacted patient care when we can talk about outcomes. Talk, when we talk about outcomes, our program becomes very valuable and becomes a key player and a key component in the delivery of care. My, my, my talking point is talk about how your program has facilitated outcomes and you will never have to ask for funding again. And I believe that to be true in almost any industry. Talk about how your program has benefited the organization and you will not have to fight for funding. That's my common coaching point when I talk to program leaders and it's something I wish to impart with you. The past few years have brought urgent and competing demands for technology changes in the health IT world. And with each change, we've asked how can we get more out of, the techn out of technology? How do we get more out of the value of dollar that we spend? Because we've invested in, in technology, but how, how, and we'll invest more. So how do we get more interoperability based with, uh, against uh, a, a backdrop of cybersecurity? How does my federal health program, federal health program, get more inclusion with tribal and partners and, and private partners um, in a world where feds and private industry play by different rules? Last year, we had our challenges. In addition to national initiatives that drove programmatic changes uh, where we made monumental change, we did so against a backdrop of cybersecurity that was daunting. As a whole, the nation saw a rise in state-sponsored cybersecurity, terrorism, and cyber-organized crime. Industry analysts remind us that 2015 was filled with, with denial of service attacks, hard to detect malware, skyrocketing number of personal internet connected devices, while the healthcare industry strove for more expanded data sharing, and at the same time, operated under greater HIPAA enforcement. The world is connecting while at least connecting more, while at the same time the threat and impact of loss is exponentially larger. The, ONC, uh, the Office of National Coordinators Meaningful Use Initiative requires my healthcare organization and others to share more information with more people for more purposes. But yet the HIPAA omnibus, omnibus rule requires us not to lose one single byte of data. It is a daunting challenge. The need for enhanced functionality ba balanced with strong cybersecurity is something that's not just my focus alone. Industry analysts conclude that every internet connected device will eventually be compromised. The only question is when. Healthcare IT professionals must maintain a vigilance to protect data for our patients who entrust their, us with their healthcare information as a matter of our tr most sacred responsibility. Within the Indian Health Service, I hold that to be true. The, pa the group of patients that we serve are probably the least likely or least able to defend themselves in the event that their information was ever compromised. You know, hackers compromised more than 100 million healthcare records in 2015. 100 million healthcare records, making 2015 the worst, rec the worst year on record for the industry with respect to cybersecurity. The threat is real and it stays in the forefront of my mind. Warnings aside, industry analysts have predicted that 2017 could be a worst yet, year yet with, with, relate, 
with regards to health related cyber attacks and that's why I work to make sure that my IT security organization more than ever has received staffing and funding support to carry out their much needed mission. I'm very proud to say that my organization, I have an award winning cybersecurity program. Over the past two years, my organization has won several cybersecurity awards, including one for workforce improvement uh, under the 2016 uh, Giz I think we say this Gizla, but this Government Information Security Leaders Awards. We've also won two awards from NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, for our 2015 and 2016 Cybersecurity Awareness Month campaigns. And next month, we will be honored at the CSO 50 Awards in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, where CSO uh, magazine has ranked my cybersecurity organization as one of the 50th, 50 best in the United States. Since I'm mentioning awards, I'll also mention another quality award, um, the, which I think is an astonishing. Um, it's very impressive that the Indian Health Service has earned the Sure Scripts 2015 Cyber, uh, White Coat of Quality Award, and that was the fourth year in a row. And if you're not familiar with that award, um, th that award recognized the Indian Health Service for not simply replacing handwritten prescriptions with, with system facilitated transmission of prescriptions, or e-prescribing as we refer to it, but for seizing the opportunity to learn and apply continuous improvements in electronic prescription accuracy, completeness, and safety. We are the only federal healthcare system to have been have to be multi-year award winners. Though the need for cybersecurity is at an all-time high, my focus for the coming year is also aimed at addressing a need for greater usability for user interfaces for the electronic health record system my 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 federal agency deploys and supports. My organization is not alone in a need to, to address user interface and overall usability. I've read a recap of last year's industry-wide changes about health data interoperability, which pulled the healthcare industry's focus away from a focus on user interface and usability in favor of larger national initiatives. In an online blog, a provider, a healthcare provider, ranted that in 12 minutes, can a clinician enter 200 structured data elements, manage 140 healthcare quality measures, be empathetic, never commit malpractice, and make eye contact with the patient? And he claimed, no, it's impossible, which is why we must, and it's, he blamed the system usability as one of the things that held him back, which is why my focus on system usability and user interface is of great, tremendous focus. Or is, is tremendous, rather. If you're unaware, as I mentioned, the EHR industry uh, has, a, has, has an industry-wide complaint uh, on usability, and it's something we as IT professionals must bring our, our expertise to. I'd also like to comment on one big topic in the, in the healthcare industry, and that's health data interoperability. That's the ability to share health patient records from one provider to another through the hospital chains through through uh, pharmacies through across the spectrum um, health data interoperability which i think will be the holy grail for the health it industry for the next 10 years um, while there are many challenges on the regulatory and financial sides on the technology side achieving true interoperability means establishing a common set of protocols um, data formats and standards Unfortunately, we in the healthcare industry got that a little backwards. We all developed systems and then, then decided we were going to vote on standards afterwards. But previous attempts to achieve interoperability have been met with limited success. Um, however, they've given birth to numerous electronic health information uh, sharing arrangements, protocols, standards, and data formats. Many of them are still in place in various regions, yet some of them are fundamentally different from one another. The nationwide interoperability roadmap released by the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology suggests that by the end of 2017, basic connectivity and data exchange will be established between electronic health care systems and targets 2024 as a year for when nationwide learning health IT systems will be fully functional. Personally, I find the milestone of 2017 overly optimistic and will most likely to see the roadmap complete by 2020. But I believe in operability, believe in, in uh, interoperability, and want my organization to move towards greater inter interoperability capabilities. In my opinion, true healthcare, 
True reform in healthcare is the change in a healthcare system that frees data to track patients, measures outcomes, and identifies instance, instances where healthcare needs to be improved. Health IT is at the center of that effort, and the changes in environments that we see in healthcare IT, healthcare in the United States are the, are the value of health IT. Um, I screwed that up. Let me try that again. The changes and improvements we see in healthcare in the United States is the value of health IT, are the value of health IT. Oh, I wrote that wrong. Um, and we may see a true, we may see a true bre uh, breakthrough in interoperability. Uh, we may have seen one arrived recently when we saw the Apple iOS 10 release, which included a CCDA or clinic. It's 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 the document viewer that, that allows you to or the consolidated clinical document architecture. Um, that's a structured uh, format for patient charts. That's what I'm trying to get to say. Uh, as an extension of HealthKit, Apple bought a L, Apple built a CCDA viewer uh, which can display transmission or play can display transition of care documents in a patient friendly format. They modified Apple Mail and, Secure, and Safari browser to understand CCDA XML headers and automatically uh, uh, offer to open the documents in HealthKit. CareKit, another Apple development, enables care plans, patient-facing sub subjective data uh, gathering, such as what is your mood and how is your wound, feeling, wound healing, uh, progress dashboards, and secure communication. With objective data integration, sensitive data gathering, CCDA viewing, and care plan dashboards and communications, the suite of Apple, tours to, uh, Apple tools empowers developers to create the next generation of patient uh, engagement documents. Now, I don't have an engagement with Apple except for my iPhone, but I will say that as purely as someone who watches developments in various te markets and technologies, Apple's tools may have done more to accomplish uh, the goals of interoperability than any other single influence. Um, as a CIO, I'm con I am concerned about a, sh a, sh a shortfall of qualified health IT professionals in the United States and in the Indian health system. Faced with an aging population and with increased dependency on health IT, the, the health IT role of success uh, of healthcare organizations for the future is pivotal. Uh, developing our workforce is crucial, and I believe the focus for the next generation of IT workforce. I believe in the next in the next generation of, of our of our IT workforce, and I ask that you you consider a career in health IT. The jobs in health IT uh, today are, uh, will not be the challenges that the workforce will face tomorrow. I like to remind college groups when I talk to them that the job that I do did not exist when I was selecting my college major, and many challenges are. Uh, many of today's challenges will not be the struggles of tomorrow, and the problems of tomorrow will not be met with the tools of today. We need bright minds, and I'm excited about what, what awaits health IT as an opportunity and as a career. Healthcare support occupations and healthcare pr protect practitioners are projected to be the two fastest growing occupational groups between 2014 and 2024, increasing 2.3 million new jobs and accounting for one out of four new jobs. This is where the growth is, and as you look out on the career horizon, I urge you to consider bringing your talents, ambition, and education to the world of health IT. So there it is. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the PHS, talked about being a CIO, talked about health IT, and talked about outcomes and the need to focus on cybersecurity. I've shared my concerns uh, for our workforce and I, in hopes that you can help me with ideas on all of these topics. I'll re reiterate something I started with, is that when this conference is over and when our time together is over, take away something you've gained from here. As I mentioned, the value of our time together is the value of what you do with what you gained. Thank you for having me. Questions for Dr. Reeves? With the uh, HIPAA and this new interconnectivity age that we're in, this Internet of Things age, how do you see HIPAA being either changed or the new technology being changed to work with to Israel? these privacy standards that have already been set? 
what are the ways that it can stay private? I'll, 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 let, I'll let the legislators work on how to change HIPAA, but I will tell you that in my organization, we've become very, very uh, concerned with those that we connect with. Uh, if, you, if you look at the large breaches in the past, such as Blue Cross, the Blue Cross breach, those kinds of things, uh, hackers did not attack the main target, the, main, the, the one that made the headlines. They attacked everyone connected to that. And if you look back at other, other attacks in the past, Home Depot, uh, the Hilton, uh, others, they, they attacked it, They attacked something that was connected to their ultimate target. Um, if I could, I would wall off my system, but every time I do that, we can't send radiology images out, and I can't transmit prescriptions, and I can't do everything else. So I'm very concerned. There's almost a cyber public health, if you will, like you're only as, you're only as clean as your neighbor kind of a thing, and we all have to work, have to focus on cybersecurity. You know, you get nervous when one of your former professors is going to ask you a question. <laughs> I have a question in regard to the healthcare. You talked about 2015 having the largest healthcare breaches with, I think, 83 million coming from Anthem alone. Um, so, what do IT professionals, how can they help? But what can our healthcare industry do to prevent this when they are just starting to recognize that there is a problem in the, in the past you know, couple of years? Uh, that's a great. That's a great question. So, well, what what can we do? What one of the things I I've seen recently, and I've only become recently aware of this, is um, there is actually a, a healthcare CISSP designate or, or track you can go. So, I think the industry is in in a, in a sense maturing a little bit to say the generic, the, the generic. Uh, cybersecurity, which is which is which is good, it's a great foundation. Uh, we actually start to twist that and, and tweak it so that it, it actually might meets um, not only cybersecurity but HIPAA and all the other stuff that we have to have to keep in mind. Captain, I just got a quick question. I'm going to ask this is actually from the perspective of a father. My daughter's finishing up her second year of medical school. Um, with the changes in IT. Uh, is that being addressed um, with the practitioners that will be using systems in two, four, six years and what their responsibilities are? Most, uh, yeah, great question. My, uh, I've worked with a lot of new providers. We, we have them both as, both as, as interns, as, 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 as they, they do rotations through our organization. Uh, most of the schools seem to be have at least some sort of electronic health record system. They're getting great exposure to that early. Um, also, I believe through the maturity of electronic health record systems, we're starting, we, we, when we start focusing on, on user interface, usability, we'll, we'll start to come around a common set of tools that will actually make, make that a much stronger tool for a, for a healthcare, or healthcare provider than say they've been in the past where every system was different. Um, one of the things healthcare providers don't understand is why can I, why can I do my banking? Why can I do everything else on an Apple iPhone, but yet I have to sit down in front of this clunky old PC and go through a roll and scroll interface. Um, and, 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 and um, uh, patients don't understand that either. We, we create patient portals. Patient portals is something where you can engage your, your, your healthcare, uh, but it's in, in your, your healthcare record. It has to be, those have to be more useful than just say, for example, refilling your prescription or scheduling your next appointment to really get true patient engagement. If that's all it is, well, it's just a glorified calendar. So but this, there's a lot of tools that are waiting to be developed and I'm hoping to get some bright minds to help us. So in regards to a uh, IT degree and uh, getting a job after you graduate, it seems a lot of uh, most of the IT jobs are connected to another industry, whether it be banking, government, in your case, healthcare. How much further learning or uh, m more knowledge do you have to have about a specific industry in order to become an IT professional in that industry? Or is that something that is kind of universal that any IT student or graduate can get into and learn about the field after you start? It, well, in, in, great question. In, in, in my case, I, I brought my a set of IT skills into an organization 
and then learned about the organization as an, sort of an on or and, and the industry is more of an OG, OJT thing uh, through it. So I, I you know, internships and other aspects I think would be fantastic. Um, so it's more, but it was more than just learning how to connect the printer or how to reset passwords, those kinds of things. And then being able to communicate that with the, with the individuals in that industry, doctors, nurses and all, they, they, they all went to, they all went to, 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 to medical school or, or, or nursing school or whatever to, to deliver care. Not a one of them went to, went to school to learn how to run, learn, run a computer. And so making that connection, um, it's a little on you. It's a little on finding that person in, in the clinic who's that, he, I got a couple of doctors in my organization who like to be hackers, if you will, you know, and so they actually, they actually, you know, um, helped me a lot by making the connection between my IT people and the back end of the medical community. And so learning about the industry, whether it's banking, automobiles, whatever, it's having that interest in being able to make that connection.